Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conversations in Horror, the podcast. My name is Kevin Powers. I am the festival director and program director for Something Wicked Film Festival and Events, and welcome to our podcast. Now, we have been doing several episodes over the last month or so in honor of the amazing Roger Corman, and we are going to continue with that today as we delve into one of the films that he was he produced called Death Race 2000. Um, uh, and to start this conversation with me uh, today is Thomas Tillerello, who is a, 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 a who is one of the people who kind of had me uh, want to do these uh, films or these conversations on some of the Roger Corman's films. Roger Corman, by the way, if you're not familiar with him, I know there's a lot of people who are not. Uh, had a profound effect on the uh, the the film industry, not just horror genre, but every genre. <laughs> he produced movies in every genre known to mankind, jumping from fad to fad, producing way more movies than probably anyone else, and directing movies as well. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away recently, and we wanted to honor that uh, that that legacy by uh, having conversations based on some of his films. So, if you are just getting with our our uh, podcast now please check out some of the other episodes that we've done in some of his other movies and we are glad that you're here to listen to us talk about that so thank you thomas for joining us oh thank you for having me kevin it's a lovely day here at the stations and horror speedway and we got so many racers coming down the track that is a good way to start this off because this is essentially a precursor to fast and furious films which I believe Corbin also produced the original of that too, didn't he? Well, yeah, I think the original Fast and the Furious was made in like it was a drag racing movie yeah. produced in like nineteen in the late fifties. But uh, Corbin's first movie was uh, a western in nineteen fifty five. I'm not a hundred percent positive that that one was one of his. Uh. But yeah, this movie definitely. I'm not. I'm not to look that up because I didn't even think about that. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking about I was thinking about all kinds of modern parallels to this movie and we'll get into it. Um, but like Fast and Furious was not one of them. <laughs> I know I'm surprised that didn't come up. But yeah, I, like this it, this kind of um the, I we I well I I don't know if it was you or me, but oh I think it's important for us to do this movie because it's probably one of Corman's most uh, famous movies that he did as a producer and famous movies that is an original script. I mean, it's not an original, I mean, it's an adaptation of a short story and we'll get into that, but it is, it wasn't chasing a particular trend, I don't think, <laughs> you know, and it wasn't a ripoff of anything in particular. It was <laughs> its own thing. And it kind of created so many uh, imitators and, I mean, heck, the next year, the director basically did the modern-day PG-rated comedy version of this with David Carradine and, and called it Cannonball. And it was like the first Cannonball Run movie. So if you don't know what that, if you don't know what that is, ladies and gentlemen, Google that sucker. <laughs> yes, and by the way, everyone, uh, he did, uh, Corman did help produce the original the Fast and Furious movie. I had to look that up because I even forgot about that. I just knew that if there was an original version, but I, I don't think I've ever seen the original version of that either. <laughs> Me neither. I don't think anybody has. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to ask because my experience with this movie is very different than maybe yours. Because uh, you suggested we do this film as part of our, our tribute to Roger Corman. So tell me a little bit about uh, your experience watching this film and enjoying this film. Well, the first time I saw it, it had to have been on Netflix years ago when Netflix was young and still delivered. <laughs> um, I don't remember like where I was in my life or anything when I saw it. Um, I just remember thinking, oh, cool, this movie I've been looking for for eons and heard about and seen clips of, I can finally now watch in its entirety. Mm -hmm. Isn't streaming amazing? <laughs> and that's what I, that's what I thought. Uh, but like years and years ago, I had seen, I, I know this movie by reputation. And I, and I remember generally very much seeing the poster for it in a video store somewhere and being intrigued by this idea of a race that you well i thought that you had to kill your, each other to kill, to kill the fellow racers in order to win the race 
Um, and I think I even had a, a video game on our PC computer that was kind of like that. Um, so that idea always intrigued me. And over the, and then I also found out about it through, um, I found out what the plot was and everything through this gigantic phone book sized book, which I wish I had a prop up to show you, but it was called Video Hound Golden Movie oh. Retreat. And for those of you out there, folks who are old enough, yeah. probably over 40, you guys remember the Video Hound Golden Movie Retriever book, which had tiny, like, thumbnail posted, sometimes postage stamp size, um, movie reviews in their 10,000 pages um, with a nice little index in the back and, like, an awards index. This was, like, IMDb in paper form. <laughs> it really was. And there was a time in my life, actually, I think my Aunt Sharon who's a film editor over in Hollywood. Hi, Aunt Sharon, if you're listening. Um, she gave me my first Video Hound book um, because before MDB, that's how you found out, hey, what movie would this so-and-so do? And, you know, nice say 1960s, bam. If it was on video in any form at all, Video Hound had it. Mm -hmm. and, and, it and it rated movies on a one to four bone instead of one to four stars. Uh, so... Um, I can't remember what this rating for uh, for the death race. I think it was a two and a half, actually. Um, two and a half bones out of four bones. Uh, but anyway, or may, it might have been two. I don't know. It rated a lot of movies two bones now that I think about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, they were kind of harsh over at Video Hound. But Video Hound like, sometimes would, would, um, would mention also if it had a sequel or something. And uh, so I read about it there, and it said that there was a death race, 3,000. Turns out that's not entirely true. We'll talk about that later. Um, so that's where I found out about it, and that's how I originally saw it. And then when I finally did see it, I thought, you know, it was it was good. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a wild ride. It's certainly no Mad Max Two: The Road Warrior, but it's loads better than that Jason Statham remake that they did not too long ago. So now that you bring up the Jason Statham remake, I actually really enjoyed that movie only because I'm a I'm a I I'm inter, I'm entertained by Paul W S Anderson's movies, and that was one of the ones that he directed was that the remake of this, uh, which is very almost resembles nothing of this original movie. But I liked that movie enough when I saw it, and and let's first tell everyone out there I've only ever seen the the remake once. When they originally came out, <laughs> it's not like I've seen it more than once. And I go watching it, uh, but that movie did prompt me to go find the original movie, uh, Death Race 2000, which I had never seen. Um, I had seen Death Race, but never seen Death Race 2000. So I came to this one much, much, much later. Um, I did not care for this movie when I first watched it because I to be honest with you, after re-watching the film, I really didn't get it the first time I saw it. I just saw this low, and don't 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 knock it because I watched a really probably a really crappy version of it when I originally watched it. And, and the movie did nothing for me. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. I didn't remember it after seeing it. When I rewatched it, I said, Oh crap. I had to, it was like, dude, I was watching the movie for the very first time again. The when I originally watched Death Race 2000, after watching Death Race, uh, I it, it did not leave me with any type of impression, and I I can guarantee you I did not get it until I just rewatched it. Um, because now, like I was telling you before we started our conversation, I actually think it's a really damn good movie, uh, especially in the way that the story unfolds. I think it's really, really good. So that's why I'm excited to talk about it, which is very <laughs> rare for me on this show, where I watch a movie again and reevaluate it and really enjoy it the second time around. Um, yeah. this film I had no impression of, and then I rewatched it because. Thomas told me to, and now I really, really enjoy it. So, thank that's you, why you right? That's right. Thank you, Kevin. That's why you listen to Uncle Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> well, and another thing that um, some of the fans out there might be asking, some of our listeners might be asking mm -hmm. the pertinent question that we will that we that we'll just address and move on, which is this is conversations in horror, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a horror movie. That's what they would say. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, I would say. Well, you're right, Mr. Hypothetical Listener out there, or Mrs. Hypothetical, or whatever you are. Um, but honestly, I think there is a case to be made mm -hmm. that this 
movie is a kind of horror. And I would call that the sub sub genre. Uh, I would call it social horror, mm. which is to say that um, I would put this in the same. Uh, and then I'm not saying like social horror in the sense of the cast of Jordan Peele does. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, <laughs> I, I would argue, Kevin, that the term social horror as applied to movies like uh, Get Out and you and Us is actually a misnomer. Um, all horror movies really deal with social and political issues in one way or another, no matter what. I mean, Night of the Living Dead is a big example, of course, but this movie in particular is super political. Super um, political. Oh, yeah. And what I would say that social horror really is um, something that actually uh, Vincent Price said when he was being interviewed um, when I was doing research for Mask of the Red Death. He said something interesting where he said um, somebody asked him if his movies scare him. Um, and he said, no, no, he says, uh, he says, he says, and he said, in fact, uh, I don't think that the fixtures I do are horror films. I call them thrillers because they give you a thrill. Um, movies like The Man with the Golden Arm. Uh, those are movies that are horror movies to me. Those scare me. Uh, because that movie, if you don't know, guys, uh, guys and girls out there, that was like the first Frank Sinatra did this movie called The Man with the Golden Arm. And uh, that movie is like the, one of the first Hollywood movies ever to deal seriously with heroin addiction. So that movie was really hardcore back in the day. So I would say by today's standards, social horror would be things like Chernobyl, Mm -hmm. Requiem Requiem for a Dream, or if it's a dystopian type thing, which is what this is, um, then I would put it in the same category as say the Purge movies. Yeah, I agree. Where, yeah, where the horror quote unquote is coming from this idea of let's explore a social issue and then take it to its inevitable horrific conclusion Mm -hmm. and and look at the depravity of this future society let's look how deep hell really goes and what might be lurking around the corner and where this movie kind of is adapted from is what well i thought actually it was a completely different short story but Mm. knowing these two different short stories together gives you an idea of the genre that this movie comes from um william f william f burroughs kind of did this sort of thing for a while too this sort of dystopian horror type thing but um i thought that this movie was kind of uh and during the video hound days i thought it was basically an adaptation of this short story um that i read about an Asimov science fiction magazine called Coming Attraction. Coming Attraction was a story by Fritz Lieber. Uh, they published it back in 1950, and it was about a post-nuclear New York, um, Manhattan. It was like uninhabited and filled with the dregs of society. And some British guy was just walking down the street, and the streets are just overrun with gangs that run around in cars that have fish hooks on the side of them and they're hoping that the fish hooks would snag the ladies off the sidewalks and drag them with their cars by their skirts and uh it turned out to not be that that story but the actual <laughs> story that I'm from was a was a was a story called the racer by uh another pulp science fiction author called uh eb melchoir Melchor. I'm not sure I can pronounce his very Dutch name properly, but <laughs> it was, but it was a very short story uh, about this world, this 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 post apocalyptic, not really post apocalyptic, but definitely dystopian reality in which the national sport is the death race, a cross country race where the drivers go, and yes, they could kill the f- fellow racers. Uh, in order to be the first to cross the finish line, but you you also have to be the one with the most points, and you mm-hmm. get points you get points by slaughtering pe- pedestrians on the highway with your car, and different people get different point scales, um, and that's in the short story. But in the short story, it's just one driver, and he kills somebody on the highway, gets points for him, and stops his car. And gets out of the car and basically has a moment of conscience as he starts looking at this dead body. And that's pretty much the story. Uh, Roger Corman took that and said, 
well, that's not going to be very exciting, and just kind of took the world and the milieu of it, and maybe like the the hint of that scene a little bit in a in a further in a scene later on um, with one of the fans of Frankenstein, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. But basically, Corman does what Corman does with short stories and pretty much anything he adapts, which is pretty much take the he'll take the idea of it, the germ of it, and make his own tree. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what he does with this. But as and as social horror, I would also say that before we move on, that a big a big component I think of social horror, especially this kind of social horror, is the idea is the theme of the gamification of slaughter. And we saw that earlier in the two thousand Maniacs uh, show, hmm. where you have. We had the gamification of slaughter, and like I said, the Purge movies have built an entire franchise around the gamification of human slaughter, which I think comes to us from the Colosseum, uh, comes to us from like you know Kumite, you know martial arts tournaments to the death, you know yeah. all these the the myth, but also historical reality of a depraved society that's so depraved that they would have sports in which the stakes are literally life and death yeah so, so when, you're, yeah. when you're talking about this because this is a great point uh one of the reasons why i love this movie uh, uh, now uh is the fact that um this is something that you've seen that we've seen in a lot of other films and it, it and it makes me want enjoy this movie more something like the running man uh, and uh, uh, use it to purge, and it, it, it's one of those. It's one of those concepts where, in the future, we have to cull the masses by giving them this game that that, that rewards people for death, for killing people, and the purge, Running Man. Uh, all these movies have that element in it, um, which I can't believe I missed when I originally saw this damn movie when I was younger. Uh, cause I love the running man and I actually really enjoy the purge movies a lot. And of course, uh, 2000 maniacs, when we, when we, did, when we talk, talked about that, you brought that up and I said, God damn it. Yeah, you're right. I didn't think about that until you mentioned it. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And, um, uh, I think, uh, this sort of thing's going to be with us probably till the end of time or at mm-hmm. least until, at least until, uh, let's hope this doesn't happen, but at least until, our society gets to the point where we actually do have death races again and gladiatorial combat. <laughs> well, I, I mean, even the remake Death Race had this same ca- concept in it, and I forgot about the movie Gamer uh, has the same concept in it. So we, we yeah, we, yeah, we see this, we see this a lot. Surprisingly, now that I think about it, <laughs> but Corbin, yeah, old- Corbin, yeah, is so early. Oh yeah, he was always a trailblazer when he wasn't chasing a trend. Yeah, but he would be. There were times where he would be so forward thinking, and this was one of those. And I think a lot of that has to do with that he let um, that. I mean, obviously he did co-write the script, but also I think he let Paul Bartel, the director of this movie, really lean into the satire. Yes, because because Corman realized very early on that if you did this movie seriously, it would be super grim. And nobody would watch it, and he wouldn't make a dime off of it. And he was right. So he, that's what sets this right. movie. That's yeah. That's what set this movie apart from, you know, even death, even the the remake, um, which I felt like it lacks leave, satire. It lacks the satire, but well, I wouldn't say it lacks all satire. What it did was this is the only thing I remember from the Jason Statham freaking death race is that. It satires itself in a weird way. It satires action movies by gamifying it to the point of absurdity. <laughs> um, because um, I don't know if the only thing I remember from that freaking movie is how they turn the racetrack basically and the way you score points. You have, they basically turned it into a giant video game, but it's real. It's like they have power ups. They have like all these things that you would get in a video game, and somehow they exist in reality. And it's just like, what's the point? Um, in this movie, the the point is um, the idea of again the gamification of slaughter, the 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 celebrityification of mm-hmm. 
murderers and um, political figures who present themselves like gods. You have Mr. President. And uh, that's all he is, is Mr. President. He has no name. Uh, <laughs> and he presents himself as this god who rules from afar. Like, literally, he's, he's overseas. But when you see him open, you know, giving his uh, pregame uh, speech, it's like he's shown in this, like, divine um, iconography where he's, like, this, this godlike figure stepping down from a long staircase that descends up into the red sky. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's uh, before we move on though, and get deep into the, the 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 beginning of this movie, which I would argue the begin the first fifteen minutes, not even twenty minutes, the first fifteen minutes of this movie are a master class in world building mm -hmm. and character development and stake setting. It does all of those things very quickly, and honestly, uh, I'll, and we'll and we'll tell you why. Uh, I believe this movie, at least the first 15 minutes, should be shown in film school classes as an example of this is how you do that without very much exposition and or this is how you do exposition in a way that's interesting. So, um, so you mentioned <laughs> the beginning and I want to say this before I for, uh, forget because I made note of it. I, did, I, don't, I don't know if any other movie has ever done this. I'm sure there is, but Roger Corman may be the first to do it. Uh, but the film opens with the Pledge of Allegiance. Yes. Uh, to the plan. And I'm like, holy shit, dude, that's a brilliant opening for a film that's having the 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 get you I'm gonna use your word now because I love using your word gamification. Uh of everyone in, in the United States glorifying this game, uh which they've been doing for the last 20 years, because this is the 20th anniversary, uh, which also marks the president with no terms who's been in office for 20 years because he started the game to begin with. These are all things I noticed when I rewatched it. I was like, holy shit. I didn't <laughs> notice any of this watching it originally. I just, I just, you know, it, it wasn't, it just went over my head. Uh, but the opening with that Pledge of Allegiance, and it's like, it's almost like a propaganda opening for an opening movie. Like it's telling the audience, you are safe here watching us present a game about violence, about violence against innocent people that we are all rooting for. Like, like I was like, holy shit, dude, this was a great it beginning. It sets up the entire world, and you immediately, like you said, go to each of the drivers. And I was like, uh -huh. wow, how the hell did I not see this when I first saw this movie? I'm like, dude, this is a great opening for this movie. Oh, yeah. Like, Corman and Paul Bartel use the format of, like, and, and they're not they're not completely into it. It almost has a found footage type quality to it in the beginning, because they're showing you everything from almost exclusively, not entirely, but almost exclusively from the point of view of the new of the media coverage of the sporting mm -hmm. event. Yes. It's, it's now the very first frames are not exactly the arena there is this wonderful little opening title card thing with these uh with these quasi animated shots of the cars <laughs> and the title that comes zooming at you shiny and chrome uh, before it goes to this close-up of a trumpet and the national anthem yeah. uh, those by the way apparently were done without roger corman's consent uh because the because paul bartell said they needed a good title card and Corman was like, no, that's not in the budget. So basically, he put up his own money and got together with an animator friend of his, and they did the title cards themselves <laughs> without Corman knowing. <laughs> so this is probably one of the few times where somebody pulled one over on, on Roger Corman, and they were right. <laughs> but <laughs> they they go to the... They, so they, so they, what's brilliant is like they use this structure, this kind of... Uh, not steaming, um the this, this kind of ESPN structure mm -hmm. of uh, introducing the world and introducing all the drivers and introducing them in a way that's quick and concise mm -hmm. and shows us everyone's thing because everybody has a thing mm -hmm. but they also, but they also build up piecemeal in a very short still in a very short period of time your main character Frankenstein mm -hmm. played by David Carradine who was fresh off, who by the way was fresh off of 
finishing Kung Fu. Apparently, like, two weeks ago, before he started making this movie, he walked off the set of, of Kung Fu. And he picked this movie because he needed something that was as far away from uh, his character on Kung Fu as he could possibly get. And he That's really funny. wanted this movie to be a hit. And he really wanted this movie to start immediately. Because if he didn't do something right after Kung Fu, he said, I knew my career was dead. But oh, wow. thankfully, but thankfully, because back in those days, like if, back in the day, you have to remember, ladies and gentlemen, in the 60s and 70s, there were two kinds of actors. There were movie actors and there were TV actors. And generally speaking, they did not cross over. No. Um, that sort of thing didn't happen on the regular until the era of George Clooney. When George Clooney transitioned from ER to From Dust Till Dawn, that opened the floodgates. Um, now nobody bats an eye. But back then, that was a big deal for a TV actor to transition to movies, even if it was a low-budget expectation movie like this. It was still something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Paul Bartel uh, and them just kind of get together, and what they do is... Um, you first you see that the first thing you see is after is, is oh, by the way I think it's funny that I don't know why I didn't notice this before but like in the crowd yeah at the, before you see any of the drivers you see there's a guy with a Nazi flag in the crowd <laughs> he's kind of awkwardly fumbling it like uh why are we why am I waving in that why am I a white guy waving a Nazi flag what's going on here I think he's probably uh, hoping he wasn't going to get beat up or something. Um, because they shot this in very liberal uh, Los Angeles, so yeah. But like, you get the fans, and you get the announcers. You got sportscaster Junior Bruce, mm -hmm. who's supposed to be kind of like a twisted parody of Howard Cosell, and his dad, who was the low key ver uh, the low key version of Howard Cosell. By the way, for you youngins out there, mm -hmm. uh, Howard Cosell was a sportscaster guy who was very big into the boxing world. And he's who John Boyd played in uh, Ali. So, uh, with Will Smith. That's who Howard Cosell was. If you, still, if you still don't understand, Google him. Yeah. But, but we, keep go, we keep going back to uh, our, our other sportscasters. Like, there's another one called... Um, What's her name? Uh... Oh, the, the girl, yeah. Oh, Pander. Pander, Betty Pander. Pander. <laughs> yes. Who has massive Effie Trinket vibes. I'm almost positive that that's who Effie Trinket was kind of sort of based on in the Hunger Game books, is this character who is like giant blonde hair and says that everyone she interviews is a dear, dear friend yes. of mine. <laughs> and we go and we go to see her, her uh, point of view of the camera and then outside the camera looking at her with this futuristic looking camera. By the way, though, this movie takes place in... 25 years into the future from the 70s when this was done. And mm. and we do see some nice little map paintings of the future Los Angeles with some future look inspiry, uh, you know, freaking buildings and a subway that goes between skyscrapers because for some reason everybody thought that subway trains would go in tubes between skyscrapers in the future. We still don't have those, but okay. But like she... It's like we're going to see Frankenstein, who is the lead, who is the champion mm -hmm. of the death. And he's mysterious because he wears a mask. He's mysterious because they call him Frankenstein because he's had all his parts changed because he's been in so many crashes that he's had all his, his arm, his legs, his eyeball. Everything has been replaced and stitched together by Swiss doctors. He has to go overseas, just come back from overseas from his latest surgery. But he's in this gurney. And he's in full costume under the gurney. <laughs> and he appears to have uh, some a messed up left eye, apparently. Uh -huh. And also, this is where you get your director's cameo, Paul Bartel, as his doctor, saying, no more pictures, no more pictures. That's Paul Bartel. Oh, okay. And, yeah. And, uh, but, once you, but what's funny is you don't see Frankenstein all at once. Hmm. At first, you just see his feet walking. And then you may see his back the back of his head with this kind of wild iconic looking almost SM costume that he's got going on. It's just black faux leather because David Carradine refused to wear real leather. Um, I guess it's vinyl <laughs> or something. Pleather. I don't know. 
if they had oh leather God. back in the 70s. <laughs> but yeah, you finally when you finally do see his eyes, it's like it's his uh, the only thing I could think of to as an equivalent, he kind of looks like the gimp from Pulp Fiction, to be honest. Okay. <laughs> he really He really does. It's just a black leather hood. It's not real leather and just three holes, two for his eyes, one for his mouth, and a and a and a and a plastic looking mask over the mask. Yeah. Which is really but anyway. And that's that's what he is. And he is he's got like his teeth bared all the time and he's kind of stalks around a little bit like almost a lumbering Frankenstein yeah. monster a little bit. And that's your guy. This is your hero. This is who you're supposed to root for. <laughs> and you're like, what? This is our guy? Really? Not handsome Nero the hero, played by uh, uh, freaking uh, Marty Cove, by the way. The sensei who shows no mercy on Cobra Kai. Love yeah, I didn't, re- I didn't realize that until I rewatched. I was like, holy shit, I didn't know he was in this movie. I had actually <laughs> forgotten that uh, Mary Warrenoff was in this too. I was like, what the hell? This movie has a lot of stars I don't forgot about. Oh yeah, Mary Warnoff, who uh, some of you uh, might, might not know is kind of a scream queen. Um, she did uh, well. Actually, I go going back to Paul Bartel. Um, she was uh, kind of very famous for being the cannibal wife in uh, Eating Raoul, which is what Paul Bartel would later go on to do as mm. his big kind of cult classic. Uh, so they played those same characters though in an extended cameo in the original Chopping Mall. I love and, it. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, and like, so that so Frankenstein's our hero, not Nero the hero, and not Sylvester Stallone. Not Sylvester. <laughs> That's right. Sylvester Stallone is in this movie, and he's not the hero. In fact, he's a big fat jerk. <laughs> <laughs> he plays a guy like all. Oh, by the way, like they everybody's introduced in their cars, mm-hmm. except for Frankenstein. Except for Frankenstein, and all the cars come up to the track and wave to the crowd and say some words to the press or say some trash talk to the other racers. And freaking Sylvester Stallone's car, all the cars, except for the Nazi chick's car, Matilda the Hun, and uh, and 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 uh, and Stallone's car, they're all based on animals. They're all like different animals, except you know, like even Frankenstein's car is based like on like a dragon, mm-hmm. and it's got teeth coming out the fender. There's spikes coming out of uh, Nero's car. It looks like a tiger, I think. Um, and of course, Calamity Jane, Mary Warnov's car, is a giant bull with bull horns on it that they that she uses to impale people. Uh, and she does to great effect the Matador guy. I know, <laughs> I love that scene now. I know, right? But Mary Warnov um, kind of went on to be like this sort of scream queen who was like a very tall, tough kind of lady who's the sort of person I think who would probably like fit into like you know the kink culture if you know what i mean Mm -hmm. um but she's very believable and very endearing in this movie and weirdly enough she could not drive she had not learned i don't think she ever learned how to drive a car so every time you see her quote unquote driving in this movie that's a stunt person i did not know that okay yeah yeah i think she was the only one of the cast who could not drive but uh so stallone's car is basically like he's supposed to be um uh, his motif, his thing is he's like a vain kind of 1920s gangster. Yep. He's got literal Thompson submachine guns mounted on his uh, on his uh, on, on, on his uh, headlights. They don't ever actually fire any bullets from those Thompsons. <laughs> so I guess they're just decoration. But, he, but the thing he kills people with is this giant knife in the middle of the car that comes out the, the hood which made me think weird kind of Rambo looking knife there. <laughs> Interesting. Oh, but anyway, I think his name is like Machine Gun Joe. And yeah, Machine Gun, Gun Joe. Joe. Yeah, Machine Gun Joe is just so pissed off that everybody loves Frankenstein. Yeah. They only really care about Frankenstein and they don't care about him. So he's trying his, so that's his thing as a character is he's trying to do something better than Frankenstein. That's all he cares about. And of course, you know, Nero is very vain. Calamity Jane has terrible luck, but she, you know, is is basically nice to her fellow drivers, except for Matilda, who's a total Nazi. <laughs> <bee-yuck>. 
and, and that's who the flag was for. That's who the Nazi flag was. Yeah. So she has. Um, I love her. Uh, everyone, every driver. By the way, every driver has a navigator of the opposite sex mm-hmm. who helps them navigate cross country. And I love Matilda's. Matilda's uh, navigator's name is uh, her is like Herman the German. I think it's hilarious. I don't know why. Uh, uh, and I also love the, and I also love the trash talk that they exchange. Uh, Matilda says to Calamity Jane in an almost like Schwarzenegger sort of way, "Whoever called your car the bull was only half right." <laughs> Very clever. Uh, yep. 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 But like they have, um, so but then you get to Frankenstein when he's finally getting into his car and he's out of the eye of the press. But as the but the but the function the press serves though is that the press is there to give the audience information. Mm-hmm. They give and because they have these rapid fire questions and because they also have uh, Miss Pander get asking asking other questions and sometimes getting answered, sometimes not. Every question and every answer is important. Every single thing is set up and pays off later. Yeah. Um, but I mean, just, just a couple of quick examples here. Um, we get a little more when he's talking to the press, he's talking about um, like we find out the president is going to fly in from Singapore, wherever the heck he's usually at, and he's going to crown the winner of the race. Mm-hmm. That's going to be important later. We find out that uh, one of uh, Frankenstein mentions or one of the reporters asks about the fact that uh, one of his latest upgrades is he's got a cyborg arm. That's super important later. We find out that uh, he's been paired up with a navigator whom he's never met before. And according to, I think, Pander, she's a, quote, real sex pot. All of that is important and pays off later. And then, bam! The, the pacing goes, 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 and we are away. And he meets her, and her name is Annie. And immediately, there's distrust between them mm-hmm. because he doesn't know her, and you figure you, you get the impression that she's hiding something, and she is. So all of this, all of this has been set up. I timed it. It is fourteen and a half, almost fifteen minutes. And by the time they are racing off and get to the first kill, actually, no, um, they started their engines and they go. And I think it's Stallone's car who gets the first kill, which gives you your kind of first little bit of entertainment value. Because on the way to this first kill, you do see the cars streaming down the highway, bumping into each other, some mm-hmm. great you know, road footage, chase footage, and then Stallone kills somebody. And it's. <laughs> Oh, gosh, this poor guy. It's a construction worker who was 38 years old. We know this because the TV tells us. And Stallone, like, rams him in the crotch with his giant knife at, like, 50 miles an hour. And it's very fake blood, but it's all over. And all this is in 15 minutes, the first 15 minutes of the movie. Screenwriters out there, if you can fit all that kind of stuff in your first 15 pages, I guarantee you, somebody will want to read your script. <laughs> it's amazing. Well, the other thing is uh, you make, make a point. Uh, they, they, do a, they do a really good job setting up the beginning of the race, having them race against each other, bump into each other. And then, of course, when they splinter off into their own directions before meeting up at the central location. Um, I do love the way that they end up killing or not killing certain people because Machine Gun Joe does everything that's expected and what the audience expects of him, whereas mm-hmm. Frankenstein turns the tables constantly throughout the entire movie. Oh, yeah. That's a good point, Kevin. I didn't think about that. And that could be like a, a kind of underlying theme that I didn't even think about is the idea of how do you succeed in life uh, <laughs> in a weird way. Um, because it reminds me of something that Stallone himself said in the interview I saw years ago. I think this is right when around he when he was doing that 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 stupid racing movie that he did called Driven. Um, yeah. somebody asked somebody asked him why did you do Driven, and he said something to the effect of, "Well, I think that there's uh, 
that uh, there's two sports that are really a metaphor for life. Um, and yes, I am going to do this impression more than once. Uh, the, he said wrestling and racing are the two sports that he said, in his opinion, most encapsulate human existence. And I think that's part of Joe's problem is that he keeps doing what's expected of him. He keeps, uh -huh. tr he keeps trying to do it so well, but he's really just doing what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. He's not under he's not creative enough to do something really world changing like Frankenstein is trying to do. Yeah, so I I noticed this only on this second viewing, like when they all line up the suicidal old people. And of course, he avoids them and kills all the doctors and people. I'm like, dude, this is hilarious. This is so great on commentary. The, the fact that all these people are are either they're volunteering the old people or that they are sacrificing the old people. And Frankenstein is like, I'm not going to play by your rules. And he kills all the doctors and nurses and everything. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. But that's not the first time he does it either. Like, he kills... Yeah. Uh, you know, he kills the one person who's part of the racing organization, and they don't know how to, they don't know if they should give him points for killing that guy or if it's even legal. I was like, is it legal to kill one person who's associated with the racing organization? We weren't expecting that. I was like, oh my God, this movie was so freaking hilarious with its commentary and the way that it uh, it threw away expectations. Oh, yeah. And also, we should probably, uh, we should probably lay it down for people because the movie lays it down pretty much right after that first kill. What the point system actually ah. is, because it's kind of funny. And yes. Sick. <laughs> it says, and as the Howard Cosell clone sits down and gives us the, the lowdown, he says, women are 10 points. Uh, teens, 40 points. Toddlers, babies under five, are 70 points. Old people over oh. 75 100 points. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and they make, a, they, make, they make a very big deal of the fact that uh, Frankenstein misses out on all these points by not killing the old people, but killing the younger uh, nurses and doctors. And I'm like rolling because Frankenstein had, and, and that's a, a good uh, way of you know, foreshadowing that Frankenstein has his own ulterior motives that no one knows because he's not playing by the rules. Oh no! Oh no! And also, it should be no. It should be. It, we should probably make this clear as well, ladies and gentlemen out there listening, is that um, while I did mention the first kill is bloody, and there are other ones later on that mm -hmm. are very, very fast and very bloody and gory, which is I think enough to barely qualify this as horror. Um, and then, like I said, social horror because yuck, uh, yikes sometimes. <laughs> oh boy. Um, although I begin to wonder what they left on the cutting room floor because I think oh, yeah. it probably wasn't more. Oh yeah, I guarantee um, it was so more. They, just, just so they could get an R rating. The um, the 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 when Frankenstein kills those nurses, there are some that that those kills and some others that happen later have a kind of Looney Tunes quality to them. They're cartoonish. And not really very bloody at all. Like literally, he goes behind this. Like he goes up on the sidewalk uh, <laughs> behind some planters. And you don't even see his dragon car. You just see the bodies of <laughs> these limp bodies of the nurses and doctors going. Boop, boop. Yes, I loved it. I was like, oh my god, this shit is so fucking hilarious. I like. It, it reminds me of this uh, stand-up comic routine i saw years ago i don't even know what the context was but i remember it's so funny that he was like oh he was describing like drunk drivers coming home for christmas and he was like you know they get in their car and they're just like up on the sidewalk <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so wrong <laughs> that's the kind of humor we're dealing with in this movie mm -hmm. <laughs> Despite the serious subject matter, they play it really. They 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 play it really. They play it to the hill uh, in terms of the the satire and the comedy, and they do a really good job of balancing it uh, because it is gory. And the comment that you're there you're watching essentially is uh, sanctioned murder uh, during a freaking racing event that everyone watches. You know. Yeah, and now that I think about it, now that I think about it, like the. 
the exaggerativeness of the violence is for, for satirical effect. That's kind of the same sort of thing that Paul Verhoeven was doing in the original RoboCop. Correct. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. So again, right in this case, you know, Corman and Paul Bartel were way ahead of the curve. <laughs> um, normally, this is the sort of thing you would think from an outsider coming in, like like Verhoeven, to make fun of American culture and its bloodthirstiness. But here you have two red-blooded Americans doing that. Yeah. Um, we should also probably take this point to kind of <clears throat> say that at this point, the movie does uh, introduce us to another faction, another, uh, the de facto kind of almost antagonists of this movie, which are the rebels. There is an underground movement to bring freedom back to America and overthrow the president. And they're very strange. Uh, there are these people who dress like, they're in like well they're in some sort of weird like factory or something that's their mm -hmm. hideout i guess but they're dressed like railroad workers from like a thomas and friends kind of cartoon and also their leader is this stuck up old school marm called thomasina Payne, which by the way is a reference to thomas Paine, the one of the founding fathers of the constitution um a guy who was so liberal back in the day that he died destitute because nobody liked his ideas uh the uh, they even do the thing where they, they jam the TV signal to try to get their message out and say that they're trying to sabotage the race, which they call the transcontinental road rape. Mm -hmm. uh, and so because of that, because the rebels have this plan to destroy the race, and then you find out later a plan to um, basically kidnap Frankenstein and replace him with a duplicate Frankenstein and hold Frankenstein hostage in exchange for abolishing the race, which you find out is actually a colossally stupid pro plan because, spoilers, Frankenstein is not one guy. He has been several different guys throughout the history of the race. They train them in a camp and basically genetically engineer them to beat Frankenstein. And David Carradine's Frankenstein is just the latest in a long line. And when he takes off his mask, or rather allows his Annie, his uh, his uh, navigator to take off his mask, you find out his mask, his face is just a regular guy. Mm -hmm. He's just regular. He's just regular, sort of rugged David Carradine. There were no Swiss doctors. There were no stitches. Nothing. The only thing that's real is that cyborg arm, which again, that's going to come up later. Yep. <laughs> but yeah, so um, their plan is stupid because they don't know. And uh, Frankenstein knows, though. and uh, But they keep trying to sabotage and or kill each of the different racers with these kind of wily e. Coyote-type traps. And literally one of them is, in fact, a wily e. Coyote trap. You know, Kevin, the Mimi Roadrunner cartoon gag where Coyote will, like, take a, you know, will paint an exact <laughs> painting of a tunnel through a uh, mountain uh, and like hope that the roadrunner just runs into that painted wall and dies but it turns out the roadrunner goes right through it but the coyote does it they literally do that in this movie i was hoping you were gonna bring that up because i only real realized that for the first time when i watched it i was like oh my god this is like a fucking cartoon uh, it is they literally do a looney tunes cartoon gag with the bodies flying uh, up into the sky and with that whole sequence and, of course, the Matador sequence, I enjoyed this movie so much more because I saw the same thing you're you're referencing. I go, oh, my God, this is a Looney Tunes cartoon. How did I never see this when I originally saw this movie? <laughs> <laughs> but, like, there's so many different layers of satire, too. There because there's also, there's also, like, this kind of very cynical... Um, satirical comment on history and society when the rebels are talking about their plan and uh like they're having a really deep conversation about who really made frankenstein oh oh they're they're not sure why frankenstein's disobeying and playing by his own rules mm -hmm. you know they're like why did he miss those people was it annie who persuaded him because they can't the rebels can't fathom this idea that frankenstein is his own free agent and can think mm -hmm. for himself 
they think surely surely our agent because you find out that annie is working with the rebels and is in fact the daughter of thomasina Payne, and she's got her she's there on the inside trying to trying to make sure that the plan to capture frankenstein goes off that hitch and they're like what's going on here Hmm." so it must have been annie of course i was right and then they start talking about how this race is like it's like innocent people getting slaughtered on the highway like Christians being thrown to the lions. And then the leader says, but the Christians won that time, uh, referencing the fall of the Roman Empire, which actually Christianity had very little to do with. But anyway, that's a whole other thing. Uh, <laughs> that was more about the Visigoths and the uh, political corruption. But anyway, but the guy says, she says, but yeah, but the Christians won. And then the other guy who's dressing, dressing up with a wide-brimmed hat for the next gag, basically, he says, did they? And when he said, did they, boy, oh boy, that was a hard bit of cynicism that kind of hit me in the face because, well, stick up your head and look around at the political landscape that we're in right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, it also, I mean, it also fits within the context of the movie. You have this world that is basically the Roman Empire all over again. And it seems like that great revolution really did nothing ultimately. At least it did temporarily. So, yeah. yeah, it's that, it's that, huh, kind of satire. You know, yeah. I, used to, I, used to have this, I used to have this definition of satire um, that worked for me. Maybe it still does. I don't know. But I used to have this definition where satire is comedy that you don't laugh at. You just go, huh. Huh. That's your reaction, you know? To me, yeah. And, and to me, sometimes I think, Especially when I see like a movie that's marketed as a satire that was made overseas, like Triangle of Sadness is a great example. Triangle of Sadness is one of those satires that you look at and go, "Huh, yeah, huh," and that's it. Or the Menu, another good example. The Menu, you're, you're yeah. Not, yeah, they're not laugh out loud, slap your knee, no. funny, but uh, that's that's what satire is to me. You know, social satire at its highest. Mm-hmm. That's what that's what it is to me but thankfully we have also some looney tunes kills sprinkled out to make us actually laugh really hard yes uh it, 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 they, those type of things bring in a, a tone that makes the film work uh in, in any other regard if it, it, it this if it, if they had taken the, the 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 same situation and made it too serious i don't think it would have worked I think from the very beginning of our conversation, you mentioned uh, the way that they present their satire makes the lunacy of the concept work. You have one of the five top drivers is a Nazi driver who the audience or some of the audience members absolutely root for. Like, <laughs> this is like, it's it's working at a different level because if you, I hate to say that, but I don't think you could get away with that in today's climate. I don't think people would get the satire. I think no, it would they, their head. No, they would. They would rip this movie apart on Twitter for sure. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. But when you're watching it under the context like I am uh, uh, now, uh, this is an older movie, and I'm watching it now, and I'm like, holy shit, this was seeing a, this is uh, uh, commenting on a lot of stuff that's relevant now. Uh, it was probably relevant back then too, because I think this was made in 76, 78. I can't remember anymore. Uh, uh, 75, 75. 75. Yeah. 75. So this was before my time. Uh, we don't, we don't really talk too much about films that were before I was born. So I did not see <laughs> that it came out. So I don't have that reference point. I don't have that reference point. So um, I, I don't know how those audiences in the seventies saw this film because back then this was the future this was representing a uh, a story that's in the year 2000 but now it's 2024 and we're looking back at it and shit the damn movie still is relevant you what's know? funny is yeah what's funny is like the short stories that they that Corbin was adapting were written in the 50s isn't that crazy and then this movie comes out in the 70s in the wake of Watergate and the Vietnam war and president and john f kennedy being assassinated 
But I think that was meant to be a comment on the political corruption and media's obsession with violence, which at the time was kind of nascent and on the rise. And boy, oh boy, they had no idea how far it could go. Yeah. <laughs> now we know. Um, and uh, boy, there was a missed opportunity with the uh, Jason Statham death race. Uh, although I will say that some of that satirical edge does come back in uh, Death Race 2050, um, which we can talk that. about. It was, it, yeah, it was, it was a lot more closer to this movie mm. than uh, than Statham's was for sure. Uh, I also really enjoyed uh, Manu Bennett as Frankenstein in that movie, just because I love Manu Bennett. I think he's a a guy who should be used a lot more often. He's got a great voice and a mm. great like screen presence. Um, and uh, I mean, there should be more uh, action heroes who are from New Zealand. Uh, doing their doing their New Zealand accent, so I love him in that movie. So yeah, Death Race twenty fifty is is worth seeing. Okay, but cool. uh, but yeah, um, it also has Malcolm McDowell as the president in that movie. So that's uh, yeah, gotta see that. But so I was I alluded earlier to a scene um, that kind of might be the last remnant of um, the original story about this racer with a with a case of conscience or has an encounter with a victim that may, may or may not change his worldview. And it comes right after um, the slightly risque massage parlor sequence um, that devolves into a cat fight between Calamity Jane and Matilda, Matilda Dunn. <laughs> um, there's a whole, there's a whole thing about that too, because like all the racers except for David Carradine are on massage, par- are massage tables butt naked uh with exception with the exception of sylvester stallone whose butt is covered with a towel um there was a whole like fight backstage apparently about um the towel because stallone did not want his butt on screen um uh, <laughs> but all the women basically were like come on <laughs> and uh we're all naked you should be too um yeah. if, even though mary warnoff has like her hair basically covering her breasts um yeah. and uh but nobody else so apparently Corman um, laid laid down the towel because his his I, his 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 case to Paul Bartel was uh, let's just say the audience for this movie wants to see more breasts than uh, Stallone's butt. So <laughs> that was his thing, and uh, yeah, that's the way they thought back then. But mm-hmm. uh, anyway, the uh, <laughs> the next scene though is Frankenstein's on his way to his room. And he's intercepted by this young, barely, barely twenties looking young girl, who has a has a has a Frankenstein T shirt on, which just says letter F, because prop department, cheap movie, and or costume department in this case. And she tells him, like, I'm her, I'm your biggest fan. I'm the head of the fan club, and I just wanted to meet you. And you to meet me, so it will mean something. And Frankenstein's like, what what will mean something? And she won't say what it is. And then he asks him something that's kind of a underlying theme of this this movie is the idea of fame and when people say they love a celebrity, what do they mean by that? And he asks her, Why do you love me? What, what about me makes you love me? Is it because I kill? Is that it? And she's like, scoring isn't killing. It's just part of the race. And that line kind of shows you this thing that happens in totalitarian societies mm-hmm. where language is changed to gloss over something horrible it allows the people who serve the totalitarian government to do horrible things mm-hmm. they're decent we're not, yes we're not we're not killing people we are cleansing mm-hmm. the mud. you know we're not it's not the it's not a concentration camp it's a work camp and so it works in two ways in that scene and it's and her and her performance is so earnest and his is just so kind of baffled <laughs> that it, it 
it, it leaves an impression on you. And I feel like his encounter with that lady kind of the gears start turning a bit. I wonder how much, because we don't know at this point what Frankenstein's plan is. We don't find out until way later. So it almost kind of makes you wonder, like, like maybe like, is this part of a journey that Frankenstein is having where he's wondering about why I'm doing what I'm doing? How can I do what I do? Because basically you find out he's on a suicide mission <laughs> and that his cyborg hand which has a big black glove that he never takes off, even when he's having sex with his uh, navigator, uh, is a bomb, basically. It's a grenade. It's a hand grenade. Ha, ha, ha. And, and he says, when I shake, the only the winner gets to shake the president's hand. Mm -hmm. And this is the hand I'm going to shake him with. So the implication is he's going to blow himself up and the president. Yep. A suicide and, yeah, a suicide bomber. And also, we find out in the very almost the very next scene that this girl, this pet of the fan club, is offering herself up to him to be killed on the highway by his car for points. I'm honestly surprised there's there wasn't much more of that in the movie because the society that it portrays is so depraved mm -hmm. that I would imagine I would have imagined there would have been a lot more like people like almost like suicide uh, club type. Like I can almost imagine a bunch of schoolgirls or college girls in uniforms just lined up, hoping that you know their favorite driver would go down the line and mow them all down and get a hundred points, you know, for collectively for collectively them. And it's a missed opportunity, but like you and that one girl, you get that that psychology, that psycho fan devotion that ends up killing her and and weirdly like he gets it but he does it because when he he mows her down he doesn't avoid her he kills her arguably she is the only quote unquote innocent person that he kills in this movie mm. you know, and, and, i didn't think about that i didn't think about yeah that. yeah and annie i mean everybody else he kills is part of the system everybody else he kills is part of this horrible system that he is the center of but Annie asks him, like, what what was that about? What what was she doing? And he says, She was show she was showing me how much he how much she loves me. Mm -hmm. And it kind of gives you shivers a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah. I, I don't I don't know what else to say about that, but that's just uh that's that that's stuck with me. I don't know why. <laughs> well, that's the thing is when I rewatched the movie, there's a lot of things that stuck with me more so this second time around than it ever did the first time around. Um, because this, I will, uh, I will admit that when I first saw this years ago, I just didn't get the movie. I simply thought this was a low budget racing movie where people killed other people to get points. I gave it no second thought. Um, watching it now in the political climate that we are in now, uh, you're, I mean, this is a movie that. It feeds uh, that feeds an audience on violence, and they and they 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 revel in it. Um, even by the end of the film, when uh, you know the, the 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 president is replaced by uh, by you know um, Frankenstein and his new bride, uh, you don't think that there's going to be much of a change because. <laughs> Some of the rules that they're instituting is no better than the rules from the old regime, even though they're <laughs> saying that they're going to get rid of certain things. They're going to abolish the the tra inter intercontinent. I can't remember the actual name of the race anymore. It transcontinental road race. Jeez, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it because it was such a thing. But the yeah, I, yeah he's, also, but, he's also saying he would abolish minority privilege. Or yeah. minority rule, basically. So. <laughs> Abolish minority privilege. Like it's like okay, so you fix certain things, but you made certain things even worse. Wow. So you're not you you, you know one government is just as bad as the next government. <laughs> I mean, it's not. I mean, yeah, it's a little bit. <laughs> well, I think in the, now that I think about it, I, I don't think it's. A question of he's worse than before i mean i think he's a little bit better i mean one thing he did say was like 
you know, I would like our capital to be moved back to uh, New Los Angeles. No longer shall our government be governed from afar. Yeah. So in the very le- in the very least, the Frankenstein regime, which by the way, he never has a name. He's just Frankenstein. It's Frankenstein. Uh, he's just Frankenstein. But President Frankenstein. President Frankenstein, yes. But he 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 at least presents himself to the American people as a human and not as like a semi-divine being who, who cannot be touched. Um like the original pre- the, the the previous president did yeah. um there's there's the, they never really do answer the question of uh is president frankenstein also president for life can he be voted out of office will he there did. be free, will there be free and democratic elections again question mark they did mention that they said they did say there were going to be uh elections again he that he's bringing them back but he they did not mention whether or not frankenstein was going to be president for for a life or if it was going to be part of those elections so you don't yeah. really know um but yeah. you put but he did put in charge the uh what's it uh, uh thomas What's her name? Oh, Thomas Cena Payne. Yeah. Yeah. They put and she and she was an extremist in the opposite direction. So <laughs> she's in charge. <laughs> so we yeah. don't know. Yeah, we don't know what she's in charge of, basically, but she we know she has a cabinet position. <laughs> and I mean mother in law now, so he's gotta give her something. Uh <laughs> the the thing is, I think what that's trying to say in its own way, and I think this is really profound if you think about it, that um and coming off of like the revolutionary period of the sixties, this is kind of very, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I can, I, I think I could say fairly confidently. This is sort of this is the sort of thing that Paul Bertel was um, trying to, to, to get across. Cause I, I get the impression he was probably a little more cynical than the liberal idealist that Roger Corman was. Mm. Um, I think what he was trying to say is basically that um something that I kind of say all the time, which is that real and lasting change happens slowly. Mm -hmm. I'll say it again, because I think it's important. Real and lasting, and I'll add the word positive, change happens slowly. You cannot expect radical political legislative social, moral, whatever, change to sweep the nation overnight and expect it. And, and first of all, to, to not expect there to be backlash. Second mm-hmm. of all, and to expect it to stick around without having instead the people swing the pendulum way back to the extreme opposite end of whatever it is you're doing, just as a reaction to what you did. So instead, you have to have slow and last slow change i mean case in point the civil rights movement the civil rights movement was a long time in coming people think it happened overnight in the 60s it did it had a it had a long gestation period and let's face it there's aspects of it that are still playing out and they're still rooting out some of the systematic racism and stuff like that you know there's that old dave Chappelle uh joke where he says like you know he's telling the he's telling the homosexual the lgbt community he's like come on guys Give it time, all right? I mean, just yesterday, somebody called me the N-word and threw a banana at my head, and that was today. These things take time. And he's right. These things take time. And I think by having Frankenstein basically be still a dictator, <laughs> but he's a less horrible dictator than the one that they had before, is a step in the right direction. Well, that all depends on if Frankenstein is still president in uh, Death Race 2050. <laughs> I think Death Race 2050 is not meant to be a sequel. I think it's a reboot. Uh, I think it's a remake. Although, if you're super cynical, I guess you could say that it's a sequel in uh, which none of that, uh, none of in which a sequel in which none of his uh, his uh, reforms stuck. <laughs> I still have to see. It. I'll, 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 I'll uh, save my opinions after I see the movie because now I'm going to go look for it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think you probably find it for pretty. Oh, yeah, you can find it on Tubi. That's right. I was looking for it the other day, mm-hmm. um, which is also where I found this movie again. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I watched um, it. Going, yeah, going going back a little bit, because we kind of skipped way ahead and we skipped over some amazing uh, action sequences. Because like at one point, there's this whole thing where 
the rebels don't know what Frankenstein's plan is, so they're trying to kill him after he escapes their switch out plan. And at one point, they try to kill him with a plane, and the plane is shooting at him from the sky. It's insane. Uh, it's great. It's great. But there's also the plot B of the rivalry between Stallone, uh, Joe Vitero, or whatever his name is, and Frankenstein. And it comes to a head um, at several points. Uh, but, they, but they do have one fight scene that has nothing to do with their car. Uh, so I was thinking we could talk about that fight okay. scene because it's, it's interesting to me uh, to see Stallone play not just an egotistical jerk, which apparently maybe he is a little bit in real life uh, because of recent events, uh, <laughs> but also a murderous psycho. Like, I've never seen him play a real villain in a movie. Like, ladies and gents, this is Stallone as you've never seen him before. Mm-hmm. He really, like, up until this scene, he's just a lughead, basically. But when he threatens Annie and strangles her and says those cold, psychopathic words to her, that's like a whole other level of evil that I did not think he was capable of as an actor. That's a good point. And I don't think I've seen him as a villain in ever. Anything. Yeah. Yeah, this is the only time I've ever seen him play somebody who is just straight up bad and you just want to see him die. Mm. Um I mean, he strangles, I mean, and he's enjoying it. He's having, like, like fun str- strangling the air out of her. But thankfully, Frankenstein comes in, saves her, and they have this comically um, staged kind of fight scene that's scored to, like, jazz. And, uh, and my goodness, uh, Stallone gets the crap beat out of him by David Carradine in his costume. He's all bloodied in his face. Uh, not quite, not quite Rocky level bloody, but darn close. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, it's it's and then like the the climax of their fight is they're bashing each other's cars, mm-hmm. and then all and all of a sudden Annie decides to give him a hand. And she throws the hand grenade, spoilers, into Joe's car and blows him up. Yep. So Annie, Annie gets her revenge on him. So that's something progressive. Which is uh, interesting because he takes no notice of the grenade. He is too busy doing his own thing. And it's his navigator that is trying to get him to stop, stop. There's a fucking grenade in the car. And of course, it's too late and they blow up because he's boom. too arrogant and not paying any attention whatsoever. He's, he like he really wants revenge on Frankenstein. Yeah, and he never gets it because he's such a because he has such tunnel vision. Yep. But yeah, yeah that's, that's like kind of like the only thing that kind of the, the I guess the closest amalgamation of his character is uh, Tyrese Gibson's character in the in the Jason Statham version, and they kind of carry over his disdain for his navigator. <laughs> In the in that version, and in the, in the Tyrese in the Tyrese version, I'll give them credit. They actually made that character even worse in that version because he keeps murdering his 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 navigators by chucking them out of the car at high yeah. speed. Which he, I which I which the first time I watched this movie, I kept expecting him to do. He threatens to throw his girl, his gangster's mall navigator, out of the car several times. Never does it. But yeah, I, I thoroughly expected him to do that. Um, he does have this funny scene where uh, this fish, this this random dude who's fishing uh, on the side of the road, and uh, and machine and Stallone that uh, gets lost, and he's like, "Hey, what's the best way back on the highway from here?" And he's like, "Oh, right, you gotta turn around up there and get back on the boat." And he's like, "Oh, hey, I know you. You're Frankenstein, man. I love you." First of all, how he can possibly confuse those two characters, I have no idea. But anyway, this in, this enrages him. He's like, "You got about two minutes to live." Yeah, and he just and he chases the poor Fisher guy down and just cuts him with his knife car, <laughs> which is what I'm going to call it from now on. The knife uh, car, and because the guns don't work, we do nothing with the guns. I didn't I notice that until you mentioned it. I was like, I don't think they ever did go off. No, they never did. And I had like a false memory 
of my first time watching it, I was like, I could have sworn he shot some people with those mounted guns, but nope, never does. I guess they're just decoration. Just decor- <laughs> they couldn't afford that in the budget. Well, yeah, it wasn't in the budget. It was we're just dumb. You've got machine gun freaking, ugh, it's dumb, but they never use it. But yeah, it's so funny how like Frankenstein performs his own switcheroo, and like you said, he kills the president, and uh, he has this wonderful little scene where they're in the car, they're about to drive off on their honeymoon, and all the reporters are asking them those questions, like, are you going to abolish the race, Frankenstein? Really? You can't do that. It's, it's, our, th- it's, our, it's our thing we look forward to. We, sure, the race is violent, but we love it that way. And it's the same guy with the kind of weird teeth, Junior, uh-huh. uh, Junior. getting annoyed. And uh, and like you said, I think there's a sense that uh, these really aren't that different. When Annie looks at him and goes, "Do we have to listen to this?" and he's like, mm, "Says nothing." Turns on the car and runs Junior over. Yep, and drives off into the sunset. Um, there are many points of this movie, Kevin, where we could uh, that that are nice kill shot moments that could have had a quip to them. Some of them do, some of them don't. But I feel like this is the moment that, under normal circumstances, I would put the Schwarzenegger alternator in. But because this movie predates Schwarzenegger's rise to fame and is probably the only time in conversations in horror history where we have Sylvester Stallone in this movie, I feel it's incumbent upon us, and by us I mean me, to change things up a bit just this once. Oh, you have and to. Instead, <laughs> and instead imagine, instead imagine what it would be like if David Carradine and Sylvester Stallone had switched parts. <laughs> and he and Stallone, the more like the Stallone we know, had become the hero, become the Frankenstein, which by the way, Frankenstein Stallone he I think he would make a good Frankenstein monster, by the way, because that face and that droopy lip. And those heavy lidded eyes, I could I could imagine that face being stitched together from dead bodies. I think that would have been a cool uh, thing, and that's a missed opportunity. But let's do for that scene, that last kill of the movie, that little that little f you to the to the media. Let's put it through a thing I like to call the Stallone alternator or the Stalloneinator. Okay. Do I need to? Do I have a part in this one? Yes, yes. you do. All yes, right. you do. I'd like you to play Annie and <laughs> um okay. and say and say, do we have to listen to this? Okay. I got three of them. So the first Stalloninator. All right, tell me when you're ready. I am. Uh, <laughs> do we have to do we have to listen to this? Nah. Turns on the car. Hey Junior, you want blood? You got it. <clears throat> Runs him over. Then he looks back and goes, plenty of it, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Number two. Do we have to do this? Do we have to listen to this, you mean? Oh, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot. Do we have to listen to this? Uh, no, baby. We, we don't got to listen to this. We could change the radio station. Yeah, let me change it for you. Yeah. You like rock and roll? Well, I like death metal. I like that one. <laughs> number, number three. Do we have to listen to this? Nope. But we gotta listen to this. <laughs> Turns on the car. Rolls over, Junior. Ah, and screams. And then as they're driving away, Stallone goes, by the way, there's this really awesome podcast you gotta listen to called Conversations in Horror. <laughs> oh man, I I I really enjoy. I I I I can appreciate the third one. I really enjoyed the second one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I'm always looking forward to these. It's fucking hilarious. I can't believe you spend time thinking about these things. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, I really do think this is probably the. One and only Stallone, Stallone-inator. <laughs> I can't imagine any other t- Stallone. There's no. He's never done a horror movie. 
I don't think he's ever going to do a cult movie like this ever again. Yeah. Um, no, nah, his one horror movie I can think of, no one remembers at all. Oh, oh I, I see I know you. what you're talking about. I, yeah, I see you. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or Detox. It was called Detox. detox. Yeah, Detox. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You're right. Oh, my gosh. You're right. That was like his one like serial killer, like <laughs> break to DVD horror movie ish kind of thing he did. Yeah. Oh, my God. I, I don't remember movie. anything about it. I've seen it. I remember nothing about that movie at all. <laughs> well, maybe we should put it on the list to see if it is, in fact, as forgettable as you don't remember it to be. Uh, well, maybe in a year or so when we get desperate for some titles. <laughs> <laughs> so, Kevin, I ask you something. I want to ask you something. Like I said, I mentioned before, Video Hound told me and kind of lied to me that this movie, that this movie, Death Race 2000, had a sequel called Death Race 3000, hmm. which I assumed would be set in the year 3000, which I also assumed what they put Frankenstein on ice or clone him or something. Um, and this, and but it turns out that movie doesn't exist because they changed the title and they changed almost everything else about it and turned it into a movie called Death Sport. Uh, but it also um, does it also does star David Carradine and it was released in I think 70, 76 or 78. Yeah, 78. Um, and it's basically the same thing, except Star Wars had come out. So instead of lightsabers, they have crystal swords that they fight with. And instead of yeah. cars, and instead of cars they kill people with, they kill people with motorcycles. Yeah, I just saw this movie. Oh, okay. Uh, it was, it, I, I, I told you, I, 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 I was going through my uh, Roger Corman movies, and I it, it, I got a shit ton of movies from uh, Scout, uh, Shout Factory, Screen Factory, whichever you want to call it. Um, yeah. That was on a double feature. Uh, out of ten stars, I only gave it four. <laughs> so oh. <laughs> it must have been really bad because I don't remember it. I do remember seeing it because I just looked it up on the poster. I was like, oh, yeah, I did see that. And I looked at what I gave it. I gave it four stars out of so ten. So you'd say it's 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 middle of the road, as it were. Oh my god! It had Richard Lynch in it. Holy shit! Oh yeah, he's the Darth Vader. He's the bad guy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I don't remember this at all, and I've only seen it. I only saw it within the last year, dude. That's crazy. Apparently, I was looking it up. I was looking it up on IMDb. And it looks like it's one of those movies that the making of this movie, the story of the making of this movie is more interesting than the movie is. Because it is one of those notoriously troubled productions. And like many of the lead actors died under tragic circumstances. Um, most famous of which like the female lead of this movie, I can't remember her name. She actually died in a car accident a year after this movie was released. Hmm. And then okay. And of course, we know much later on how David Carradine uh, accidentally died, and uh, somebody else uh, had something terrible happen to them. Oh yeah, Ellen Arkish made uh, Caddyshack too. That's what that's what's terrible that happened to him. Uh, that was a travesty. Uh, well, but, Roger uh, Corman did go through and do some re, uh, 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 I guess, some pickup shots or something. He's uncredited as the third director on this movie. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's part of like the whole thing. It's like this movie had like three Death Sport had like two or three directors because the original director was a film school graduate, this kid who knew nothing and did nothing but fight with David Carradine, and apparently David Carradine was stoned the whole time, smoking copious amounts of marijuana, and then uh, and then Alan Arkish came on and took over. And then I guess, like you said, Roger Corman himself was doing second unit on that just to get it finished. It was... Somebody needs to do a documentary about the making of this movie. But unfortunately, like I said, most of the people who are involved in the making of it are now dead. So... Yeah, you're right. That, it was originally developed as a Death Race 2000 follow-up. I did not know that. Yeah, Death Race 3000. That's why I wanted to see it. And that's why I was curious about it. Like, the, the one, one thing that like this movie is just with 2000 is a legitimately great movie, but for some people, for some modern audiences, I think we'll look at it 
they won't be able to get past the 70s cheese of it. They won't yeah. be able to get goofiness of the cars, which we even talked about the fact that the cars didn't actually work on set. Um, they they barely worked. Most of the time, they're just rolling them down a hill <laughs> or shooting them at really fast speeds so it makes it look like they're running really fast. They're not. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's like... With, with with three thousand though, it's like one of those things. Oh, sorry, I was I kind of got off off track here, but like it's it's one of those things where two thousand is is too well written and uh, too well directed to be con- is to to be considered, you know, so bad it's good. Mm-hmm. But I th- but I think if you're if you're out there, ladies and gentlemen, you're looking for a Mad Max knockoff or something like that that is so bad it's good. Maybe skip this one and go right to Death Sports. I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I I will think that yeah. I think you're right. I think because it's got Roger Corman's name behind it and it's a 70s movie, there's this automatic stigma that it's not going to be good. Um, because I hate to say this, a majority of a lot of the films that Roger Corman produced were not, in fact, good, as I just said about Death Sport. <laughs> um <laughs> Of course, I could always go back and reevaluate that now again, like I did Death Race 2000, but I, I saw Death Race 2000 in the early 2000s, so you yeah. know, there's a huge difference there now. Um, but uh, that being said, I think the audiences who are willing to take a second look at some of these uh, films that Roger Corman produced back then, the talent that he brought up, that he allowed people to make the these type of stories and the stories that he uh, wrote and developed himself. Um, I think he he actually put a little bit more into them than some of the films that he just randomly produced because it was a, a, a part of a fad. Um, I don't know if this was part of any fad in 75 uh, or if he started a fad around there <laughs> um but uh this is definitely going to be one of my uh uh my my top list of films from roger corman um and i've really been watching a lot of them over the last couple months and um this one's one i'm glad i was able to reevaluate so that's so, my- so then having said all that what do we rate this movie kevin i'm gonna pick an object pick one you don't have to pick my object but I feel like this object is the defining object of this movie. It's the MacGuffin of this movie. It is the Chekhov's gun, or to Chekhov's grenade, if you will. I think the defining object of this movie, I'm going to pick the hand grenade. Oh, the grenade. The same thing. <laughs> oh, good. Good. We're on the same wavelength. It's the, it is the, it's, it's a sight gag, but it's a fun sight gag. It's a, a sight- hand with an authentic grenade in it. I was so laughing at that. I was like, half a grenade is like, oh my god. A hand like, grenade, literally. What's what's mind-boggling to me about that is like, thinking about how it works. Like, I know the fingers bend because you, you see him manipulating them. And like, not, not to get vulgar here, but like, during their almost sex scene, midway through the movie by the way there's no actual sex in this movie there's just a lot of nudity at certain points Mm. um but like he's he's touching her chest with this glove that has a hand grenade in it he's basically molesting her with an explosive device which is interesting but you see the way it's designed the palm area has the actual grenade it looks like a vietnam freaking era grenade pineapple shape Mm -hmm. in the hand How did she not feel that is what I'm wondering about. How does she not think, oh, this is weird. This feels weird, but I'm into it, I guess. How does, like, what? The second thing that (laughs) makes me wonder is we never see, she does take off his hand, um, which is his gear shifting hand. Um, She does take it off and throw it in Joe's car but like she does some business on the palm. There's no, it's a grenade, guys. There's a pin in it somewhere. Where's the pin? She never, we never see the pin get pulled, but somehow it works. Um, I think it's a missed opportunity. I feel like 
the way the hand grenade should have worked is he should she should have um pulled the middle finger out just like completely and that's the pin is the middle finger oh wow like and then and then that's how it works that would have worked it would have been graphic you could have seen it there you know it would have been uh funny and uh yeah that's what i would have done <laughs> but so ah kevin you know what usually in our conversations mm -hmm. it's usually you who say that uh i convince you through our through our conversation to give it a higher rating than you normally might have mm -hmm. sometimes that happens sometimes it doesn't i was gonna rate this movie three and a half hand grenades uh how many do we do four or five five okay so I was gonna do that, but I know I'm not gonna do it. I'm gonna do through through our conversation. I think this movie does deserve four hand grenades out of five. <laughs> I, I'm gonna actually agree with you on this one. Um, like I said, uh, it, my 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 outlook on this movie completely changed. Uh, once I rewatched it, and I was like, I I saw the humor in it, and I saw the commentary in it, and I thought it was spot on perfect. Um, it may be dated because of what they were doing, uh, you know, obviously because it's a 70s movie. Um, but that did not diminish the fact that it still has a great story and it's so much fucking fun. And if you can get behind that, you will enjoy this movie immensely. Uh, think of it as a political satire done Looney Tunes. And you will fucking just be able to roll with this movie. This is now a movie I can just pop in and always enjoy, uh, which I've never done before. Um, I I don't think there's any Raji. Well, Little Shop of Horrors I can do that with. I like watching his Little Shop of Horrors. I can just throw that movie in and always just have a laugh when I'm watching that movie. And maybe <laughs> a bucket of blood. Maybe a bucket of blood. I'm a huge fan of that one as well. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to give this four, four hand grenades. Because uh, I thought that was another brilliant uh, piece of prop that we had to do. And I would love to, if somebody on Etsy is listening to this, go out there and make a hand grenade prop like that in Death Race. And then just send it to me. I will buy it from you. Because uh, <laughs> uh, I do that a lot on Etsy. is buy random stuff that people make based on film props. So uh, <laughs> any final words? Any other words that you might have, Thomas? Uh, you know, um, when I, rec when I, when I watched this in preparation for this episode, uh, it was like the day after or the day after the day after the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. And, uh, because like you said, this movie starts with a star spangled banner and, uh, a, a version of the American flag and, uh, and the Nazi flag, unfortunately, um, uh, I feel like this is a patriotic movie in a weird way. I feel like. Next year, ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking for something to put on your TV and there's no kids around, uh, at least no kids under uh, 18, um, and, you're, and your 4th of July party, and you want to break from the Patriot or Jaws or Independence Day, um, I recommend, you know, put on Death Race, Death Race 2000 for your 4th of July festivities next year. I will say that I did see your little uh your social media post on that your three movies for the fourth of July and I was laughing because you didn't put something like Uncle Sam on there or uh, anything else. Uh that's probably because I still haven't seen Uncle Sam all the way through. Oh. I've only seen pieces of it, and I didn't like the bits and pieces I saw, but I've I've heard it's good, so maybe I'll give it a shot next year. <laughs> It's not good. It's not one of I think it's William Lustig who did that. I think it was one of his last yeah. uh it's not it's not like his maniac cop. He tries his best to make it like that and it's not. It's okay. I was thinking that you might put something like that on there. And when we do that conversation, because as you if you're listening to this, Uncle Sam is on our conversation to do at some point. Uh you you yeah, yeah, yeah. So but, but <laughs> <laughs> that being said, I am glad we were able to uh, delve deeper into Death Race 2000. I don't think uh, we I would have ever bothered to rewatch it again had you not suggested it. So I want to thank you for that. I hope that everyone out there is listening who's listening to the podcast actually 
takes the chance to rewatch Death Race 2000. I I think it's a really great movie to watch uh, any time of year, but it will be a little bit more fun during the 4th of July. I will not lie. Uh, it, uh, but with that, check out all the other, other episodes we've done about Roger Corman. He is a amazing film or was an amazing filmmaker who put who produced a lot of great movies, a lot of cult movies out there. And we have only scratched the surface of those films. So even though our our actual dedication to him will be coming to a close pretty soon, we hope that you will seek out all of his films, whether we've done a conversation on them or not. With that, I want to thank you all for joining us for Conversations in Horror. Please check out our sister uh, podcast, Conversations in Horror Color, that is on our Patreon page for our supporters of that page only. Um, and make sure to like, subscribe, tell your friends, tell your neighbors, tell your enemies about Conversations in Horror. Thank you so much and have a good day. Conversations in Horror is a Broken Lighthouse Pictures production, produced by Kevin L. Powers, executive produced by Kelly A. Inoka, and originally filmed via Zoom technology. Conversations in Horror is hosted by Kevin L. Powers and co-hosted by various horror film lovers and filmmakers. To learn more about Mr. Powers, please make sure to check out his Patreon page and other social media platforms. Conversations in Horror is copyright 2024, Broken Lighthouse Pictures production.